Thank you, Pastor Connor. It's a joy to be here, and I've enjoyed these days, and thank the Lord for what he's able to do in our lives through his word. And uh, that's the key uh, to us, is uh, knowing what God says and following it. Revival's pretty simple. It's knowing what God says and obeying it. And uh, there's really not a lot of uh, difficulty understanding what produces revival in our lives. It's just simply knowing and then doing. As the, the old song says, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We struggle with the obedience part, but uh, thank the Lord for his word and uh, what he shares with us in it that can guide our lives in the days ahead. We'll go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We saw a verse here in the opening part of the service that we want to focus on this morning. Probably one of the hardest things you do every day is wake up. Once you get up, uh, the, the day gets a little bit more simple. But waking up is a difficult thing to do. I teach a class in the college called The Art of Storytelling. And in this class, we do a number of assignments, but one of them, I assign each student a phrase, just a simple phrase. And they have to build a 10-minute story around that phrase. So a few years back, I was assigning the phrases in the class and picked out a young man, and I said, your phrase is, I took a nap. I took a nap. <laughs> and he had to build a 10-minute story around that phrase, I took a nap. Well, his day came up for his assignment to be due, and I don't suppose as long as I live I'll ever forget his story. He was working a job at one of our distribution warehouses there in Lancaster, and it was during a winter break, he decided to stay through the break and continue his job. It was a good paying job. He was getting lots of hours. And over the winter break, Christmas season, it was even uh, a greater opportunity to work more hours as uh, packages and so on were going through this distribution warehouse. And so they offered him some extra shifts and so on. He decided to stay and work through the Christmas holidays. And so he was assigned to work all day Thursday and all Thursday night, he was working a double shift, 16 straight hours. And of course, at these warehouses, they work pretty hard. They're moving packages and moving freight. And, and so they're working physically very hard. And he finished that second shift, and he was extremely tired. He was exhausted, drove back to campus. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning. He was hungry. He really hadn't eaten a whole lot during that 16-hour shift, had taken a lunch or something with him, and had eaten that during the first eight hours. And he was hungry, but he was more tired than he was hungry. So he decided, I'll go back to campus. I'll, I'll, I'll lay down for a nap. I'll get up at lunch and uh, eat lunch at, at noon, but I'll, I'll sleep here for a, for a few hours and take a little nap. So he got back to the dorm. Of course, there aren't a lot of students there. He's, he's uh, pretty much alone in his room, and he, he, he uh, sets, uh, uh, sets down on the bed and, and, uh, and lays back and takes a nap. Well, all of a sudden, he woke up. And he looked over at the clock, and it was 5 o'clock. And he thought, oh, my soul, I have slept all the way through lunch. And it's 5 o'clock, dinner's at 5.30, I have got, I've got to get to dinner. He's extremely hungry now. So he jumps out of bed, he runs down the hall to the shower, he takes a quick shower, throws some clothes on, and runs out to the dining hall. He walks in the dining hall, but nobody's there. Now dinner's at 5.30, it's 5.25 or so, he walks in the dining hall, but nobody's there. And as I said, there weren't a lot of students around, but there were some, and there had always been people at meals, and he, he walked in there and he thought, okay, you know, in college, a lot of practical jokes, a lot of people trying to trick you, you know, and so he's walking in there thinking, okay, where is everybody? And there's not a sound, there's not at the sight of anybody. He's walking sort of carefully through there, he's not hearing anything, he's not seeing anybody, and he's thinking, did the rapture take place and I missed it? You know, he's really starting to wonder about himself. And he gets to the kitchen area, and back in the very back of the kitchen, he sees a couple of people working. He thinks, oh, praise the Lord, the Lord didn't come back at least. And so he says, hey, where is everybody? 
They said, what are you talking about? He said, well, it's, it's 5.30. It's time for dinner. Where is everybody? And they said, oh, no, dinner's not till 6 o'clock. He said, no, no, dinner's at 5.30. Friday nights, dinner's at 5.30. They said, this is not Friday night. <laughs> this is Saturday. Dinner's at 6. He had slept from 8.30 a.m. Friday to 5 p.m. Saturday. That is a nap. <laughs> How many of you would like to have one of those in the next couple of days? It's hard sometimes to wake up. But I wonder this morning, are we asleep spiritually? That knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of our sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. The book of Proverbs says, How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, in verse 5, Ye are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day put on uh, uh, the breastplate of faith and righteousness, redeeming the time. Why? Because the days are evil. Now, in this verse that we've chosen as a text this morning, there are four alarms that are going off. And when your alarm goes off or mine, the easy thing to do is reach over and hit that snooze button. Oh, just, you know, another five minutes. Another ten minutes, I'll be good. And we reach over and we delay that opportunity to awaken. And I ask you this morning, let's not hit the snooze button on God. God reminds us here that it's time to wake up. And there are four alarms in this verse. First, I see the alarm of righteousness. He says in verse 34, awake to righteousness. Did you know that righteousness exalteth a nation? Sometimes our leaders try to figure out all these ways to advance the cause of our nation. They try to increase our uh, gross national product. They try to make us a, a, a more influential nation, and they try to exalt us in some way. But the Bible makes it real simple. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Are we living a righteous life? Sometimes I... I wonder if we even know what right and wrong is anymore. It seems that a lot of people think it's not really wrong unless you get caught. You know, I didn't get caught, so therefore it's not really wrong. And that's sort of the philosophy behind don't drink and drive. You know, people tell us, well, now, be careful out there. Don't drink and drive. Get a designated driver so that you'll be safe. You know, the Bible says don't drink. See, the world says go ahead and sin. Just don't get caught. Don't get in trouble. Don't hurt yourself. Don't drink and drive. God says don't drink. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise, Proverbs 20, verse 1. That's just a nice way, a polite way for God to say, John, guess you ever take one drink, you're a fool. You're not wise. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babblings? Who hath wounds without a cause? They that tarry long at wine, they that seek after mixed wine, 
Look not thou upon the cup when it's red, when it moveth itself aright, when it giveth its color in the cup. For at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. Thine heart shall utter perverse things. Thou shalt be as he that lieth in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of the mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When I awake, I will seek it yet again. People say today, well, I can control my sin. I can stop whenever I want to. No, you can't. God said you can't. You will seek it yet again and again and again, and it will ruin your life. But we think, oh, I can, I can do that be fine. You see, this whole idea of not getting caught is the philosophy behind safe sex. We try to educate our young people about safe sex. We've been doing it now for decades. And what we're saying to them is, go ahead and sin, just don't get caught. Because God says no sex outside the boundary of marriage. I know this sounds foreign to some. But Hebrews 13, 4 says marriage is honorable in all and the bed, and that's the word koite in the Greek, bed. It simply means, and this is very explicit, the planting of the male sperm into the female. We call sex. He says, marriage is honorable in all, but the bed and the bed is undefiled. Sex is not dirty. Sex is not wicked. Sex is not filthy. God created it. In fact, if you want to get real blunt about it, the first command God ever gave to man was to have sex. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. So God's not against this matter, but God placed sex in the boundary of marriage. He said, marriage is honorable in all. The bed is undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. See, God placed this matter of the sexual intimacy of a man and a woman inside the boundary of marriage. You've got a gym night this week. You go to that gym. Maybe you're going to play some basketball or some kind of a game. Guess what? There are some boundary lines, aren't there? And as long as you play within those boundary lines, you can advance the ball or score a basket or whatever. You play the game inside those boundaries. If your foot slides over one of those lines, oh, the whistle's going to blow. You're out of bounds. What God is saying there is I've placed a boundary around this matter of physical uh, intimacy. I've placed that activity into the boundary of marriage. If you take it outside that boundary, you've got sin. And I have to judge that, God said. See, but we think, well, it's not really wrong unless I get in trouble. Now, those are maybe some bigger areas, but what about our thoughts? Or what about our attitudes? Or what about our acquaintances? Or what about our recreation or our entertainment? I mean, how do we know what is right and wrong? Well, God's given us a wonderful filter in Colossians 3 and verse 17. Paul said, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So what God is saying there, whether you're speaking, whether you're acting, no matter what you're doing in life, word or deed, we're to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we're able to give thanks to him for that word or for that deed. Now think about your life. Would God call any of your words or any of your deeds sinful? Would they be a reproach to God? Would they be an abomination to God? Would they be something that God would not approve? Awake to righteousness. We need an awakening to what is right. He that saith he abideth in him, John said, ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Wow. So our words ought to be words that Jesus would use. By the way, that's what Paul said, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine according to godliness, he's proud knowing nothing. Are your words words that Jesus would use? Are your deeds things Jesus would do? Are your thoughts that which Jesus would think? 
are our reactions that which Jesus would respond in kind with. The alarm of righteousness. But secondly, I see the alarm of revival. He says, awake to righteousness and sin not. Now, I think sometimes there's a misconception about revival. Often we think of revival as a time on the calendar. In in Greater Vancouver Baptist Church, you've privileged me to come every March, first part of March, and preach a revival meeting. And, and, And I'm very thankful for that. And I've lived my whole life preaching revival meetings in churches and camps and conferences and things of that nature. And and I love the concept of of taking some time on a calendar and kind of focusing our hearts on spiritual things and maybe kind of disrupting the flow, so to speak, of life and, 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 and forcing us to kind of focus on what God wants to do in our hearts for those few days. And it's a valuable time, and I believe it's a biblical concept of, of a revival meeting. But sometimes we sort of compartmentalize revival into that four days or that week or whatever, that week at camp or maybe that, that conference or, or that week at the church, and we say we had revival or we're going to have revival at our church. But in God's thinking, revival is something that is continuous. You see, he says, awake to righteousness and sin not. In other words, in God, when when God looks at things, he doesn't want us just to awaken at some point during a week of meetings or, you know, get concerned about our life spiritually on Sunday morning and then kind of go our way the rest of the week and forget about it. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Sometimes we kind of use 1 John 1, 9 sort of like a lucky rabbit's foot. You know, we got this thing in our pocket that in, in, when we sin, we can, we can confess it and, 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 and then we can go on our, our, our way. We, we, we sin knowing that we can confess our sin and, and so we go confess it knowing we're going to go sin again and we go sin again knowing we can confess it. We confess it knowing we're going to go sin again and God says, stop. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Whoso covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh it shall have mercy. You see, this matter of revival, it's not just, okay, we got our four days in. Okay, boy, thank the Lord, tomorrow we, can, we don't have anything tomorrow night, and, and we can kind of go back to the norm of living how we please. No, no. God intends to awaken us to truth, awaken us to what's right, but then to continue in that truth. If we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. God sounds the alarm of revival. Years ago, my granddaughters, my, my two oldest granddaughters were visiting our house. Their names are Katie and Annie. At the time, Katie was about four, Annie was two. Katie graduated from high school this year, so this was a few years ago. And uh, their dad and mom, they were traveling at that time. John was preaching as an evangelist, and they had stopped by our house on a Friday night, <clears throat> late about midnight. They were passing through and going on to another week of meetings, and they, they called late night said, hey, we're really tired. We've been traveling all day, and, and uh, we're not going to quite make it to our destination. Could we stop at the house and just crash for a couple hours? And we said, Sure. We'll be in bed. We'll leave the door open. So they came in about midnight and, 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 and got everybody down, and, and uh, we were asleep. Next morning, I got up about 6 o'clock, and I'm out there, and, and Katie and Annie, they're already up. I mean, they had been sleeping in the truck. They had been, you know, rested, and so they didn't need a whole bunch of sleep. And uh, so they were up. April had gotten up and, and given them a bath and gotten them dressed for the trip, and they were all, you know, ready to go. They were excited. And uh, so I'm kind of, you know, we're giving them some breakfast and just kind of talking with them. And, and uh, I said, well, <clears throat> I need to wash my car. I had been traveling as well and had gotten in the night before and was leaving again later that afternoon as well. And I thought, I, I need to wash my car. And so I, I said, I'm going to go wash my car. <clears throat> well, Katie and Annie, boy, they jumped up from the table. and They followed me out to the garage. Four and two-year-olds. 
And they said, Grandpa, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to wash my car. They said, why? I said, well, because it's dirty. Why? <laughs> well, because I've been traveling. Why? <laughs> well, because I'm an evangelist. Why? <laughs> because God called me. Why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so... We got the bucket, and we got the brush, and we got the hose, and we got the, you know, spigot, and we got the soap, and, and, and they're saying, Grandpa, can we help? Can we help? Can we help? And I said, well, you know, this is kind of dirty. It's kind of messy. And I said, tell you what, I, I'm going to wash the car, and then when I get it all washed, you can help me dry. Let's go get some towels. And we went in the house, got some of the old towels, and gathered those up, and I gave them to them. I said, now, come on outside. We went outside, and it was a beautiful sunny morning, and I got the car out, and, and I hooked up the hose and, and put the spray nozzle on there, you know, and got the bucket and the soap. And, of course, these girls are just watching this, you know. And I'm filling that bucket up, and the soap bubbles are coming up, and they're like, whoa, <laughs> this looks like fun. And so uh, I start spraying the car. Well, you know, water to kids is like an invitation to trouble, you know, and so... They're getting close to that car, and they want me to spray me. I said, no, no, girls, you stay up on the grass. You stay up here. Your mother's already got you all dressed. You stay up here. You're going to get messed up, and, and she'll be mad at you. So you stay up here and just watch. I'll tell you when it's time to help. So I went back to spraying the car and got the brush, and I'm starting to, to scrub the car. Well, the hose, it, it kind of leaked a little bit there at the, where the spigot was uh, hooked up or where the, the nozzle was hooked up. And so some water was uh, building up there on the driveway on the cement. And, and boy, those girls, they saw that. And, and with my back turned to them, they, they came off that grass and they started, they started you know, playing in that water. Well, I turned around and saw them and I said, girls, get back up on that grass. Now, don't get in that water. That, no, water's nasty. It's dirty. You, you don't want to get messed up. You stay up here in the grass. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Grandpa. <laughs> And I went back to washing the car, and now that water's building up a little bit more. And pretty soon they're back in that water. I said, girls, get out of that water. Get back up on the grass. Yes, sir, Grandpa, yes, sir. And I went back to washing as fast as I could. Now that water's getting deep. And I turned around, and Katie and Annie, I mean, they're sloshing through that water. Katie's in the lead. She's the leader, four years old. She's just stomping in that water. And little Annie right behind her, stomping in the water. And they're singing they're singing as they stomp through the water. And they're singing O B E D I E N C E. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. And I'm looking at this thinking, what is wrong with this picture? But you know, the Lord really spoke to my heart that morning. Because so often I would be singing revival, but still sloshing in the water of the world. And so often we kind of get into this compartmentalization of our Christian life and we, we know it's important to go to church and yes, we're going to sing these great songs and hear the message and we're going to maybe even respond to the message, but then we go out kind of the same way and God says, wait a minute. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Now, why is this so important? Some of you might think, man, uh, preacher, I, I, don't, I don't like this kind of preaching. I don't, I don't like people talking about sin. I don't like people talking about these negative things. Well, why is this important? Why is God sounding an alarm for righteousness and revival? Because thirdly, there's the alarm of redemption. He says, awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. You see, the reason that God's people need to be righteous and live in a state of revival is because some people are lost. And they're not breaking the doors of the church down to hear the truth. You know that some people, the only Bible they'll ever read is your life. Ye are our epistle. Written in our hearts, Paul said, known and read of all men. Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. You see, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of God, which is the image of Christ, should shine unto them. 
That's a long sentence. Well, let's see if we can understand it. Would you stand up, sir? What is your name? Junior. What is it? Junior. Junior. Stand right like that, okay, Junior? Can you just stand up? Don't look at them. They'll scare you. Okay, would you help me? Stand up here. What's your name? Uh, Dale. Dale, okay? Dale's going to stand right here and look at me this way, okay? Now, let's see if we can understand this verse. For the sake of the illustration, let's let Junior represent God. You've got to use your imagination. Okay? <laughs> now, we're made in God's image, so who knows? Okay, so Junior's going to represent God. Dale is going to represent somebody that's lost, somebody that's not saved. Okay, Dale, do you know the Lord is your Savior? If you were to die right now, where would you go? Isn't that great? You know what? I can't take that away from him, even for an illustration. Because once you're saved, you're secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're saved. You have an assurance of your faith, and I'm thankful for that. So Dale is saved. I did this one time. I called a kid off the front row. I said, you, uh, you, you're saved, right? He goes, no. I said, well, just be yourself. <laughs> and so <laughs> he, uh, he was and did a great job. And after the service, when I gave him the invitation, he was the first one for you. He said, I don't want to be that lost guy anymore. I want to get saved. But Dale is saved, okay? So Dale knows the Lord, but for the sake of the illustration, let's let him represent somebody that isn't, okay? So we got God, we got a sinner. Now, I'm going to represent a Christian. I'm saved, but I've got sin in my life. I know it's there, but I'm not willing to deal with it, okay? Now, the Bible says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. That's Dale. Whom the God of this world, who's the God of this world? Satan. Whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, that's Dale, lest the light of the glorious gospel of God, which is the image of Christ, should shine unto them. Now, does God want the sinner to be saved? Yes. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's God's will that you be saved. He loves you. He died on the cross for you. He's given you eternal life, but you must receive that gift, and he wants you to receive that gift today. Today is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. So God wants the sinner to be saved. But does the prince of this world, does the devil want the the sinner to be saved? No. No. But is the devil as powerful as God? No, because 1 John 4, 4 teaches us that are saved, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So while the devil is very powerful, he's not as powerful as God. So the devil can't go up to God and say, God, you're not going to save anybody anymore. He can't do that. God, <laughs> God's bigger than he is. Okay, he can't do that. But what can he do? He can put the Christian with sin in their life between God and the sinner. Now, is the gospel still shining? Is God still sending out the light? Yes. Is the sinner seeing it? No. It's being hid. And how many people in this world would tell you if they're honest, the reason they're not a Christian is because of a Christian? It was Gandhi who said, I'd be a Christian if it weren't for Christians. See, that's why the alarm of righteousness and that's why the alarm of revival is so important. Because there's the alarm of redemption. God wants Dale to be saved. But when we're blocking that message, when our life is that hypocrisy that man sees, the light never gets to him. Thank you guys, you did a great job. So the alarm of redemption And if we don't wake up to these first three alarms, if we don't hear the alarm of righteousness and the alarm of revival and the alarm of redemption, one day we're going to hear the alarm of regret. For he says, awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. One day I'm afraid some people are going to stand before God and quote the Bible without even knowing it. There's a verse in Psalm 142 and verse 4 where it says, I looked on my right hand and beheld, refuge failed me, no man cared for my soul. 
And while the lost world may not know that verse, one day will they stand before God and say, God, I, I didn't know I needed to be saved. No one ever told me. No one ever lived the Christian life before me. No one ever showed me you through their life. God, I, 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 I didn't know. I speak this to your shame. No one cares for the souls of men. We care about how we look. We care about how much money we have in the bank. We care about our friends. We care about our social media. We care about our sports team. But we don't care that people are lost. The alarm of regret. I was preaching at the Bill Rice Ranch in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. There was a church there from a little town in Ohio, Hayesville, Ohio. It's a great church in a very little, little town. The youth pastor was the pastor's son. His name was Steve, and he had brought the teenagers to camp. They had an unusual youth group. They had 25 guys and five girls. And the reason for that was Steve was single. <laughs> and so he was kind of hesitant about reaching girls, but he was doing a great job with the guys. Well, he brought these teenagers to camp, and the pastor, Steve's dad and mom, had also come, but they had driven separately. They brought a little camper and were staying there at the ranch. And the teenagers were in cabins, and at the ranch, if you bring some teenagers, they normally put you uh, as the sponsor or the youth pastor in the cabin with the kids as the counselor. Well, Steve was single. He didn't have a wife to stay with the girls, so they took his five girls and they put them in with another group of teens that, that were from another church, and so they were in a cabin. But then his, his guys, they filled up a cabin with 25 of them, so he's staying with the guys. He's the counselor there in that cabin. One morning, a, a call came to the ranch for the pastor of that church, and in the office, uh, a man received the call, and he said, well, let me go give him the message. He'll call you back. So he got up and came over to the camper where the pastor and his wife were sleeping. It was 5 o'clock in the morning. Knocked on that camper door, and the pastor awakened and went to the door and heard that he had a call, and he said, well, give me just a minute. He got dressed as best he could and went outside and followed the young man back to the office, made that phone call. From there, he walked to the cabin where his son, Steve, the youth pastor, and the 25 boys were sleeping, and he went in, and he woke up his son. He said, Steve, we're going to have to get the guys up. He turned the light on, and now these boys are being awakened out of sleep, and they're not really understanding what's going on. It's 5 o'clock in the morning, and they're thinking, what are we doing? And as they were stretching and yawning and trying to get awake, pastor went over to the bunk of a young man whose name was Chris. He's 15 years old. And as Chris was trying to get his eyes open, pastor knelt down beside his bed and he said, Chris, I got some bad news. He said, your mother just passed away. She was 34 years old. She had been ill for a couple of weeks, thought it was a bad case of the flu, but it turned out to be an aneurysm on her brain. That morning, about 4 a.m., she had slipped into eternity. And as that young man heard that news, he fell into his pastor's shoulder and began to weep. And the first words out of his mouth were, Pastor, she's in hell. Because I never told her once about Christ. A few moments later, I stood with that young man, had prayer with him by the pastor's car as we had loaded his things into the trunk for that long ride home. And as those taillights disappeared down that Bill Rice Ranch Road for that journey back to Ohio, I stood there in that pre-dawn and I thought, what if that phone call had been for me? What if it had been my neighbor or my loved one? Or my best friend, would I be standing here saying they're in hell because I never told them about Jesus Christ? The alarm will not easily be turned off at that moment. We must hear the alarm of righteousness. We must hear the alarm of revival. 
We must hear the alarm of redemption, or one day we will hear the alarm of regret.